Hello, you're watching Dyson Sphere program. This is Umovel, and today I will be showing a layout used to make Dyson Sphere components. A component is a high tier item used to make small carrier rockets, which make up the frames of uh, Dyson Spheres. Here we are on our planet, uh, our site of interest. Uh, this planet is going to be divided into uh, three sections. On the first section is the frame components. On the second section is processors. And on the third section, we'll be building the components. Components are made on this rocky salt lake because of its iron, copper, and silicon. Uh, the rawls will provide for the frame components made on the first section and uh, processors that are made on the second section. On the thir third section, making the components, it'll be taking in products from the first two sections while importing solar sails elsewhere. We start with putting out a pile of factory and the belts it will be interacting with. There is one output belt and one input belt. Wait a second, there are three inputs. So shouldn't there be three input belts as well? Well, that's what makes this build very interesting. On this build, uh, we're gonna be using what's called a sushi layout. Um, what that means is that the input belt will have all three items and the assemblers will only have one sorter to pick and choose all the items needed. If that works out, you will be left with a layout that uses significantly less sorters and therefore um, able to build even more in your cluster before your computer bursts into flames. Now sushi belts are nothing new, but what I think is interesting here is that the splitters are quite good at making full belts with equal amounts of items. Uh, I have actually done this with uh, two items, and apparently it can be done here with uh, three items as well. And just slow down the game, let's be a bit more sure that this is occurring. And yes, it does appear to be an exact uh, one to one to one ratio. And yes, in theory, you should be able to mix up any proportion of uh, items that you want. Speaking of proportion, uh, the math done here says that to get to five Dyson Sphere components um, with using extra product proliferation, it's going to require 12 belts of the frame material, 12 belts of the solar sails, and 12 belts of the processors. At max Maximum station piling, that's going to come to three pile belts of each of the items. That is a total of nine belts of total input. And subsequently, that means that there will be a total of nine sushi belts. In addition, the five belts of the output is produced by 640 assemblers. Dividing the five belts amongst 640 mm. assemblers shows that one of the nine sushi belts will provide for exactly uh, 71.111 assemblers, which is an issue if you are looking for an exact ratio build. I'll address later in the video how to balance the inputs amongst the assemblers. Actually, I have a plan already in place to do the load balance. Notice that I'm actually putting up 64 assemblers uh, per output belt instead of uh, 71 or 72 assemblers. Also, it's a common strategy for a single output belt to actually surround both sides of the output belt with assemblers. So instead of uh, spitting out a, a really long row of uh, say 70, uh, 64 assemblers, like I tried to divide that into 32, um, so it's two rows of 32 assemblers. Um, for some reason that didn't uh, work out. So I uh, went with just spitting out exactly 64 assemblers, um, like raw. And they you know, have a second run at the, uh, the input or third run or fourth run, so on and so forth. We've seen most of this already. Uh, three full belts going into a single splitter and to make a single mixed belt. What's new here is that at the end of this loop, the end items are sorted with a splitter to be remixed. The three belts coming from the station will serve as the so-called underfill line. Uh, it keeps the belt filled, but allows items getting past the loop to go through. Uh, this is typical of uh, T-junction. 
All these uh, T-junctions can uh, connect using uh, blueprint bridges. Marking up some uh, belts so we don't get lost and let's uh, give this a roll. Now you can either run the test in sandbox mode or not. Uh, I, I choose to do it in sandbox mode in this case uh, because it's uh, very easy to uh, set the stations to always uh, output uh, a certain amount, a certain item, uh, always full or always receive an item endlessly without having to delete it. So as we are performing this test and you know everything is coming out, uh, appears to be working actually. <laughs> Well, now's a good time to talk about why green sorters are used, uh, the Mark II sorters. Uh, there is a difference between the uh, Mark II and the Mark III sorters. Uh, the Mark III sorters, uh, the blue sorters, will always try to grab everything that it can in one swoop. Uh, this is otherwise known as uh, cargo stacking, and subsequently it will just jam itself into an assembler if there's no room. Um, if there's no room in the assembler, the sorter will be... Uh, you know, highlighted to it'll be highlighted and it'll lock into a, a waiting to unload until there is a room in that assembler. This turns out to not be ideal at all for sushi builds. Uh, Mark II sorters, the green sorters on the other hand, uh, don't have this uh, cargo story, cargo stacking, but more importantly, they'll stay in an idle state and refuse to pick up any items from the belt until there is room in the assembler. And at the end of the loop it gets, you know, resorted and, you know, recycled back into uh, the start of the loop again. Alright, now the line is working. Um, now let's see what we can do to balance all the input into our assemblers. Now a single line can go into 71.1 assemblers. And as I said before, um, it, the row is not doing 71.1 assemblers, but instead 64. So what that means is that at the end of the line, uh, we're going to have 71.1 uh, minus uh, 64 uh, assemblers that can uh, be fed by the so-called leftovers. Then we'll just quick paste over nine of these rows. Okay, it uh, kind of doesn't fit here. Um, no problem. Um, I'll just ram it. You, you kind of get it what I mean. Yeah, you guys understand what I mean, right? Right? Anyway, uh, end of these nine lines, there will be items still remaining that can feed up to 7.1 assemblers. You combine nine of those, all of those remaining items can feed up to an additional 64 assemblers. And coincidentally, that makes up an assembler row. So here's my thought. The leftover items going back to that 10th assembler row and the items unused for that is then brought over and you know what? That could be our recycling line right there. One issue with the sushi belts is that you sometimes end up, the end of the loop is ending up on the opposite side of where it starts, if that makes sense. So you'll have to use even more belt to uh, just to adjust to, you know, just to direct it back to the end of the line. Um, so it's nice to uh, kill two birds with one stone that way. So with the basics out of the way, we can now just copy this uh, output row uh, four more times. Uh, note that I am making a distinction uh, between assembler row and output row. They're not always the same thing. And in this case, um, the assembler row is 64 factories long, but the output row that makes up the full belt is actually 128 factories. So basically what I'm saying here is that uh, sometimes the uh, output row is made up of two assembler rows that are side to side instead of just one. And as the assemblers get bigger and bigger and starts occupying more area, uh, this is a good time to uh, start laying down the satellite substations. Uh, the main rule for satellite substations or any 
uh, power poles for that matter, is to be as efficient as possible. Uh, try not to get the stations to overlap each other needlessly and try to get uh, each one of those substations to cover as many assemblers, uh, factories, whatever, as possible. Uh, rounding out the output belts. And the nine, the end of the nine input belts can just be bridged over to the, uh, the tenth belt. And here's what it looks like. Uh, it's quite subtle, but uh, you can see the nine uh, output belts uh, all being routed with T-junctions and bridges all the way to that uh, last tenth belt on the left. For the input side, I dive in with the end of the recycle loop. Again, it's just two splitters sorting out the uh, items to keep in the loop. Most of the time, the remaining items Usually they're about like 10 items per second at the most. Uh, so the items that are sorted over here can just be directly added to uh, one of the sushi belts. Now for the issue of making the sushi belt. Now each belt will need one splitter. And in turn this one splitter will require three filled in input belts. And in turn, what that means is that uh, each sushi belt is going to require uh, three station ports to work. As you can see, things are going quite well. I can see with perfect clarity. So that iteration was going so well, uh, I've decided to improve on it um, with some spray coaters. So I'll put down a couple of uh, spray coaters uh, there, yeah, and, and there. I'm making them uh, all line up, of course, with a, uh, a proliferator line. And as usual, there's going to be three splitters uh, per tower. Slightly more efficient uh, way to do this um, by making each of those stations responsible for their uh, own item. But um, I've decided to sacrifice a little bit of efficiency uh, to save myself a lot of time and headache uh, getting all that belt spaghetti uh, to work. I think we have a uh, template down for each tower. Now we just uh, copy and paste. Easy as copying and pasting a Blueprint and Dyson Sphere program. The stations are in place, connected to the assemblers. The next task is to route the leftover items to the recycle. The main rule here is that the leftover items are T-junctioned uh, with priority to the mixing splitter. The priority belts are made first to the mixing splitter and arranged in a way so it will be easier to bridge the secondary belt from the station to the T-junction. So after testing this in sandbox mode, uh, we can see that the leftover items from the nine belts are actually combining together to make a completely uh, full belt for that uh, last assembler row, uh, row 10. Here we're seeing a common issue with using many T-junctions to uh, fill a belt. Uh, toward the end, that last uh, T-junction uh, on the end there will have difficulty uh, filling the belt and will start to back up. Later on, the T-junction comes to its senses, and then the belt kind of starts to empty again. Uh, this results in uh, some losses in the, uh, the production, I think. Um, there might be some improvements to try to make that work better. Um, I've seen some, some that involve splitters, or making longer belts, or using less assemblers. Bleh. But uh, I, I did try buffer boxes, actually. Um, Sadly, uh, sorters um, take items off of buffer boxes with uh, unpiled, um, and you don't want to put unpiled items in the recycler, believe me. Um, so that's a no-go. Other than that, that concludes the sushi belt build. Uh, we've built uh, 9,000 Dyson Sphere components uh, per minute. 
of course one glaring elephant in the room is uh, if one of those three items is missing for too long it can permanently back up the input loop in which you'll have to manually unclog it compared to a non sushi belt i roughly estimate that it's about 15 percent more efficient i hope you've enjoyed the build and thank you for watching